Hello, everybody. And this is another talk in support of my new book, Just Tell Me the Truth About Christianity. Today we're talking about a group of separatist Christians called the Waldenses or Waldensians, their formation, their early history, and their accusations toward Rome of practicing Luciferianism, Satanism, the mystery religions of old. So in each age of the church, groups of believers opted out of the universal system. Some were vocal and interested in making the church change through public demonstration, while others took to the hills and just wanted to practice the faith the way they viewed it, in peace and privacy. One such group that traces its origins and traditions as far back as the 2nd and 3rd century were best known as the Waldenses. However, in the early centuries, they were simply known as the Boudvois. They wouldn't take on the name Waldenses until the famous Peter Waldo popularized and organized the movement much later. For consistency, I'm referring to them generally as Waldenses, Waldensians. Modern Protestant Christians tend to idolize them as the perfect ideal for Bible-believing Christians. Their plain lifestyle modeled after what they read in Scripture was far from the teachings of Catholicism at the time. The Waldenses rejected papal authority outright as unbiblical and instead adopted a scriptural foundation for their religious practices and for how they lived their daily lives. Naturally, they were eventually branded as heretics, just like Arius, Nestorius, and so many others. The writings of the Waldenses were often suppressed and mutilated. Still, most often, they turned the other cheek, and this ensured that from age to age, while they withstood some grievous wrongs, they maintained their faith free of resentment and what must have at times been a desire to retaliate. Between the 2nd and 6th centuries, as Catholicism became not only the primary faith, but also one protected and enforced by law, the Waldenses continually moved deeper into the Piedmont Valley area of northwestern Italian mountains. Since they were educated and able to read and write for the most part, it's believed that they must have learned the faith from Paul during his two years preaching in Rome and then fled under Nero's persecution. Later, during Diocletian's rule, more Christians than ever made their way to the Piedmont. This was called the first major migration. Sources indicated, quote, the Waldenses took the Bible as their only rule of faith, abhorred the idolatry of the papal church, and rejected their traditions, holidays, and even Sunday, but kept the seventh-day Sabbath and the apostolic mode of baptism, end quote. For centuries, the Waldenses had watched the early church take on more and more paganism from Rome as well, which further separated them. After several hundred years, the Waldenses even possessed perhaps a naive view of the earlier church as somehow perfect before Roman influence. Within only a few hundred years, historians were already accusing Rome of perverting the Christian movement. Some noted that the sun god received more of Constantine's devotion than did Christ. Even the Roman currency under the first Christian emperor had him on one side and the sun god Apollo on the other. Can this really be used to make an accurate assessment of an individual's faith, though, much less an entire church? Even in modern America, In God We Trust is printed on one side of the currency, and the pyramid and all-seeing eye associated with Illuminati symbology is on the reverse. If the currency were the only questionable connection, it would be easy to dismiss. However, to the trained eye, it's not hard to see the pagan influence that morphed into Catholicism during the first five centuries. At St. Peter's Basilica, there is a solar wheel, a cross within a cross, with an obelisk in the center resembling the keyhole to the pit of Tartarus. In pagan religion, the sun is the symbol for life. Once again, the fertility aspect that had plagued the early Israelites in Canaan appeared in early Roman Catholic art. The obelisk represented the male phallus and the disc represented women's reproductive organs. St. Peter's in time came to resemble the Temple of Jupiter, and people even worshipped before the statue of Jupiter that was transformed in time to represent Peter. The serpent statue surrounding Mary perhaps meant to represent the Proto-Evangelium with the inscription, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In her arms is not the infant Jesus, but a golden sun disc. The Babylonian goddess Semiramis was called the Queen of Heaven and was said to have given birth to the sun, just as Mary as Queen of Heaven gave birth to the sun. 
All of these things just gave further proof to the Waldenses that they had made the right decision to separate from the Catholic Church. Whereas sacraments and participating in the rituals of the church were important to the Roman Catholics, self-discipline, self-denial, biblical authority, self-sacrifice were the main character traits developed by the Waldenses. For them, it was not a matter of choice alone, but habits designed to keep themselves alive and free of persecution. Those who took up the mantle of the group and were chosen to live among them only had poverty, danger, and the risk of being martyred to look forward to. The Waldenses had a thriving program of evangelism, though. Their missionaries went out two by two, just like Jesus had commanded the 70 in Luke's gospel. One newly ordained and one experienced man would take responsibility for the training of the younger and would set out for target destinations. When they arrived at a town, they most often first took up a cover trade, like the selling of goods as a merchant or whatever job or apprenticeship they could get. They were usually well-trained as part of their upbringing. In time, if an individual they encountered showed an interest, they would take out their special box of goods, handwritten New Testaments, and portions of Scripture written in the native tongues of the area they were in. Such an approach is hard to appreciate during modern times when Bibles are written in most languages. One wonders what it was like living in a world where only the church had the Scripture. What must it have been like to have to have a priest in order to know what the Bible said? What the Waldenses were doing as a means of evangelizing was technically illegal. Eventually, while no longer illegal in a civil sense, they still risked being excommunicated. Certainly, the calm, measured way with which they offered the Word of God to potential Christians helped prevent public notice. Early on, they were not big on public declarations, but quiet, measured evangelism. First, a Waldensian would focus on whatever product or service they were selling when they got settled into a new town. Only through open windows or doors would they evangelize, and even then they did so in a measured way with much care. Quote, Friends, we have treasures far more valuable than the ones we have shown you. If you will protect us from the priests, I will tell you about them. I have a brilliant gem from God himself, for through it comes true knowledge of God, and I have another that will light the first of the true God in the heart of the one that owns it, End quote. The two missionaries would gather again at the end of the day and pray, asking for blessings on their day's work. They were historically known as prayer warriors. At times, they were thrown into prison, tortured, but held on to God's promises and refused to confess bow to the wafer of transubstantiation and worship the pontiff, but only the true Christ. To the Waldenses, the Roman Catholic God was stern and sullen. They flatly rejected the idea that only through the sacraments and the priests one could come to Christ. That is not what they saw in the scriptures, and they wanted to show as many people as would listen. Many others may have likely seen what they saw were the literacy rate higher, or had they known from birth that there was anything other than the Roman Catholic Church for the development of the Spirit. By the middle of the first millennia AD, the attempts of the Western Latin Church to create a unified faith had not worked as planned. It was about to get a lot harder, as the symbol of the crescent and stars in Arabia would rise and change the course of history. Finally, I want to draw your attention to a recent article. Apparently, Pope Francis made a public apology to the Waldenses for their torture and genocide toward them in history. Here's a picture of the article, and a link will be in the description. But it's interesting to see how things that have happened throughout history are still playing out today, and how events like this verify exactly what is being taught. Folks, I look forward to talking to you next time when we're going to lay out the rise of Islam. Talk to you later.